uh, we're still trucking. It's been fun. At which one? Oh, I not not this one. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Experience Maker episode number three. This is Dan Gingis, and I'm so happy that you have joined me again. You might notice that I'm a little bit overdressed for uh, this. I don't usually wear a suit, but I happen to be at a major dental conference in downtown Chicago. So I'm at the Embassy Suites. It's a beautiful hotel. I've got a little music in the background. I've got a little waterfall in the background. So if you hear some background noise, that's what's going on. But I am super excited because my guest today is one of the all-time greats. And I'm so honored that he uh, decided to come and, uh, and join us today. Steve Spangler is one of the country's best known scientists. And um, I don't even know what else to call you, Steve, because you just, you're, you're a guy that just likes to have fun. And if, if anybody have, if any of you have ever seen the, uh, the old trick with the, uh, with the Mentos and the Diet Coke, this is the guy that created that. He is the founder of Steve Spangler Inc. and Steve Spangler Science, the man himself. How you doing, Steve? Wow, I've never been. That's what a nice introduction. Uh, first, of all, first of all, I'm loving the headset thing. I feel like I'm being interviewed on a sports show, which is very <laughs> unusual for a nerdy science guy. And uh, and and I'm dressed like Colorado. It's 15 degrees today, and uh, so it's it's see you're fancy, and I'm dressed like I'm from Colorado. Well, we got a little, we got you beat. We're, we're only six in Chicago today. It is very, very cold. But um, so Steve, I know that, I mean, I want to go over everything. I know there's been some, some more recent changes in your life, but, but back us up into how you got into science and, and just sort of, when did you become interested? Was it as a kid or was it later? Uh, it really, uh, it started as a family kind of thing. I grew up, so, so the secret, the piece that people go, oh, that's it. Here's the missing link, the beginning of the interview. I grew up in a family of professional magicians. Uh, my, uh -huh. my dad, see, my dad was uh, an engineer, chemist by degree, uh, worked in information technology, uh, kind of on the cutting edge before Google was there. They were talking about information search systems. So I grew up in that kind of environment, uh, although I just, my earliest recollection of my dad was eating fire. Uh, my mom and dad had an evening show that they did. They did uh, cruises, you know, things like that. Uh, cut her into three pieces, pulled her center out. So as a kid, I, two and a half, three years old, maybe the first memory, standing backstage in the wings with the MC look at my mom and dad eat fire and cut her in half and it all worked itself out in counseling later on but that <laughs> so here's why I lead with it because I learned the value of presentation and you talk about engagement and and here I am now fast forward 53 years later I'm uh, whatever uh, I'm, I'm talking about engagement but this was it I watched how a magician engages an audience and the disengagement was oh I can't tell you the secret so it was uh, look at this, I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good, the coin disappears. You go, how'd you do that? And as a magician, I'm sworn to secrecy. But as a scientist or a science teacher, uh, I found that that engagement pulled people in and then had them say, so tell me more about that. And that was the secret of becoming an educator that had a different slant or a different flair. So people were <laughs> cheating. <laughs> and I love that. And that's why uh, I wanted you here on the Experience Maker Show, because we we talk to people on this show who are experience makers in their industry. And you have taken something that, frankly, for a lot of kids growing up is a subject they might be intimidated by or afraid of or may not like. And you've turned it into something that is fun by creating a classroom experience. So I know I'm going to get to the teachers in a second, but I want to talk to you for a second about what have you done in classrooms to change the learning experience? Um, so I started as a classroom teacher. I spent 11 years uh, in the classroom. And and I think one of the things that, that I did early on that uh, it was by mistake is I had this wonderful principal, this great leader who um, who didn't give me a classroom. Imagine this, you get hired as a teacher. For, I'm 24 years old at the time, 23 years old. And she says, you don't get a class or we don't have one. I, little did I know I'd never get one. Uh, she put me on an AV cart. I put my stuff on an audio visual cart. If people don't know what that is, they're probably <laughs> <laughs> AV cart. What is that? Oh my God. How? And, and I put my stuff on there and I had to roll room to room and I had to learn the entire curriculum, which means that when I interacted with kids, 
um, as she would say, my principal would say, I was of service to others. Isn't that nice? Uh, it wasn't, uh, she, you know, 11 years later when she retired and at her retirement party, I'm where I'm hugging her and I'm the Susan Lucci of elementary education. I never get a classroom, right? And, and I said, Dina, I never got a classroom. And she says to me, you never were gonna get one. Why in the world would I ever give you a classroom? But every year she strung me along and she said, you learned a curriculum, you learned how to engage with kids, you learned how to engage with 580 kids, you learned all the things that you needed to learn to be of service to the school, to the community and to the staff. And so I think that it was always focused on the experience first. If I created an experience that caused kids to engage, there was a connection that was formed. And so there's three things that are super important that I talk to people about today is engagement is created through experiences and you build these amazing connections. That's awesome. And it, it does, it, it really does change everything. I think I told you, uh, so Steve also uh, was talked about on our uh, Experience This podcast, and we actually did a really fun <laughs> unboxing with uh, with some of your, uh, your subscription service, uh, and my kids were there, and Joey's kids were there, and we were, uh, we were watching them open these, uh, these science toys with, you know, wide eyes. And I don't know if I told you this story at the time, but I had a professor in business school who taught statistics and especially for marketing people statistics is that class that everybody's afraid of they don't want right. to do the math they don't like the quantitative and this guy he was this german guy named uh, carl schmetters and he made statistics so much fun yeah. and he started by just being a hilarious guy and literally people are rolling in the aisles laughing in the middle of statistics class which is just not what you expect and he turned you know a, a lecture hall full of people into statistics lovers which i thought was so amazing just by simply making it an enjoyable place to be right and and to that point i think people sometimes especially when you teach to uh, talk to educators is that they say, oh, you're now today, you're lucky you teach science because that's so much fun. You're lucky you teach STEM. I teach English or I teach math. And I, I think the most important thing that we come away with is that it's not the content, it truly is the person. And that's not what businesses want to hear. Businesses want a, a duplicate, uh, something they can duplicate, a replicable um, uh, type of action that if I do it here, I can just stamp it out here, here, and here. It's just not the case. And if you look at it in television, just a, you know, as an aside, uh, Discovery Channel, they don't want superstars on the Discovery Channel. They want great content. The Food Network, they get great content, but they want rock stars. They turn people into rock stars. And they're not afraid of this person blowing up into this rock star because they realize people follow other human beings, not necessarily the brand or the thing or whatever. So it's so important that your personality comes out and that, uh, that you you, uh, if we're lucky enough, we get to be one of those teachers that ki the kids and people in general just want to be around because you're so exciting to be there. And it's like, I don't even know. I don't even care about European history anymore. I'm just going to be with this guy because this guy yeah. is awesome. It, wouldn't that be great if that happened in business? So tell me then how you went from the classroom to being this guy that, you know, you got some pretty uh pretty famous friends at some point and you ended up in uh i know you were with ellen a number of times and you're this guy that's on tv all the time doing science how did you make that transition uh my grandfather was a teacher and and he told me at an early age sometimes teachers make so much money we get a second job and uh, he owned <laughs> an antique store and so uh, I think this entrepreneurial thing was kind of there. I, you know, I told you my dad had a, a real daytime job in information technology, but he ran a magic school. And when people of the likes of uh, this young kid, what was his name? Oh yeah, David Copperfield would come to the house. Uh, young kid running the Playboy circuit, uh, the Playboy club circuit, I should say. This was a, a, an entertainment club that, uh, take the name out of it, you know what I mean? It was, a, yep. it was a dinner club. And he was doing his magic show and uh, Doug Henning and Mark Wilson and people like that back in the day, these magicians. My dad was a consultant for many of these. And so these people were around. My dad ran a magic school, largest one in west of the Mississippi. And so people from all over would show up and be a part of that. So that entrepreneurial thing kind of, uh, grew from there. I watched him come home uh, from this corporate job and tell my mom uh, one night for dinner, he said, I'm just not having fun anymore. I don't enjoy what I'm doing anymore. And as kids, we sat there and listened. We didn't talk about it necessarily. And my mom says, so why don't you quit and we'll figure out something else to do. 
Talk about an empowering woman who was not afraid to go, let's do it. And he did. He quit that afternoon. Uh, it was the next day. And that afternoon he came home and we went out to dinner. We never went out to dinner. And he says, we're celebrating a new, a new boy. And I was nine years old at the time. So here was this magic school and this whole line of product that started because uh, he realized if we needed money, he had to be creative and come up with something. And I just watched him invent these products and and put out a little brochure, no computers, press type and whatever else. And all of a sudden we were doing mail order from our my little home in Denver, Colorado. That is awesome. That's that's so cool. And I can I can relate to that. I mean, it was just a little over a year ago that I said goodbye to corporate America and said, I want to come, I want to go work for myself. And right. now my joke to people is I like working for the Dan a lot better than I liked working for the man. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> right. You know, it is empowering. It's it all, it I mean, you you live it all the time. You go to bed thinking about it. If you're really, really an entrepreneur, you wake up thinking about it. It really consumes everything. And you have to learn how to disconnect from that because you're constantly engaged. But if anybody asks, so what do you enjoy doing? You go, uh, right now, this is it. This is exactly yeah. what I love. Take these things away from me and I'd be a miserable person. Exactly. So I know you then went, you sort of expanded from the the retail products and you started getting into educating the educators. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you now teach other people to create these similar experiences? Because that's really how you scale the experience part of it. Right. So if you're a teacher uh, and you got some stuff on the side, I was getting invited because of the television work. I, I got a, a job with NBC at the same time I was teaching with a program called News for Kids. So it was our first nationally syndicated program. And uh, so as a result of that, I was getting invited to speak. And so I get to go out and speak. And and one thing led to another. And that teaching position kind of morphed a little bit. And, and uh, I was doing student assemblies at the same time. Uh, as a professional speaker, I know that we both kind of share that in common. Uh, I logged 4,500 student presentations from uh, wow. 1990 to 2003. 4,500 of those where you show up in a gym in the morning and go, hello, kids, and here you go. And, and that, I think, earned the right to this next piece. And, and it came as a, a revelation. It's a little longer story, but the long and short of it is um, I realized that I had done what I could do there and I needed to teach teachers how to do the same thing. I had a, a teacher who came up and at the end of the program after the kids all jumped up and clapped and they were nice, she looks at me and she says, so just so that we're clear, I've been teaching for 22 years and kids don't stand up and clap for me and you bring in your little clown show and you think that you're a real teacher. And it hit me hard, you know? And all I could do is smile and say, uh, thank you, I appreciate that. And I remember going home to my wife, almost like that defining moment with my dad. And I said to my wife, Maybe I should be teaching teachers what I've learned in 4,500 presentations and some stuff in the classroom. I mean, who am I as a young kid to teach a teacher? But I think I, 11 years, had logged enough experience to be able to say, here's what I've learned from, uh, from engagement and from building connections. Maybe you could use it in your classroom as well. So 2003, stopped doing student programs and uh, really changed focus for the business. And now we do professional development for educators really all over the globe. Uh, people who want to uh, to engage more and create these experiences in their classroom that that will truly change the way kids see, think, feel, and behave, and that's ultimately the power of that experience. Is if you can do an uh, an experience versus an activity, everybody does activities, but a true experience, you craft something. Kids will talk about that and think about that for the rest of their lives. I think people of all ages will. Yeah, I love that. And it just reminds me so obviously of sort of these train to trainer programs and co contact centers, right, where we've got to get the front line to really buy into the mission and vision of the company and the personality and the brand voice and all that stuff. So that when they're talking to our customers, uh, they're exuding that. And, and no matter who you talk to in an organization from a customer point of view, you're getting the same treatment, you're getting the same language, et cetera. Um, I want to take a, a, a brief moment just to uh, thank everybody who's watching live and to say that I have finally figured out how well, to read the comments live. Uh, oh yeah, people are oh watching us, man. Oh uh, we're on we're on LinkedIn right now, and uh, and I finally have figured out how to um, to read the comments live. So I couldn't do that last week. So if you have a question for Steve, please uh, leave it in the comments, and I will be sure to ask it to him before the the interview is done. So Steve, you mentioned uh, also being a professional speaker, uh, and I know you're a Hall of Fame speaker as well. Mm -hmm. So um, tell me now that you are not uh, speaking in front of in in uh, elementary school gyms anymore. What, tell me what you, where are you speaking and what do you speak about? Uh, 
you know what? I think you, you cut your teeth doing those elementary schools. There's a thing uh, among professional speakers. You know, they'll they'll look at you. And years ago, when I started in this profession and was part of National Science Spe or National Speakers Association, still a part of NSA, uh, people would say, "What are you doing?" You say, "Well, I spent the first 11 years speaking to kids." So you're a youth speaker, and sometimes they'd look at you like, "Oh, you spoke to the kids." Now you, I'm serious. That's the hard one. Corporate speakers have got it cushy. They roll into a nice hotel, <laughs> that's all set up for them and everything. You roll into a gym and you have a principal introduce you like this. All right, kids, sit down and shut up and be good. Don't, I swear to God, I'll cut this thing off. I swear. All right, be good. And then he turns to me and goes, hope you're better than the last guy. And then he hands me the microphone, you know? So you learn as a professional speaker and, and they're honest with you. And today I get the great fortune to speak to these amazing audiences. So. I mean, public facing, people see the Ellen show, people see our television show, or we've got 1800 videos now on YouTube. I'm really branded as a science guy, or Ellen's nice enough to say America's science teacher or whatever. But the corporate work that has come in has been so amazing from an engagement standpoint to have corporations reach out and say, talk to us about the science of engagement. I didn't come up with that. That's from clients saying, and I thought that's probably, I should think about that, shouldn't I? And what does that really mean? And when you ask them, what do you want? They ask these questions. How did you build these businesses? There's three of them and we just sold two of the three businesses. How did you build these businesses where the brands speak to the customer, where um, you connect and, and where these people want to share their experiences with you and it seems so organic and how did you work it on YouTube and, and these viral videos seem uh, not formulaic but just organic and they're asking for that information. So I became an engagement speaker. I'm, you know, you're really the customer engagement expert, but here I am playing with it just from 25 years of experience. And so I'm getting to dabble a little bit in that corporate work, which is really exciting for me. So when I get to speak to a corporate audience like Wells Fargo a couple of weeks ago, um, how fun to be able to share these strategies for engagement with them as well. And it's a little bit different. It's not uh, their, their typical ordinary speaker. And of course, you got to blow up something along the way. Right? I was going to say, do you show up with your Mentos and your Diet oh, Coke? No, 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 no. <laughs> With, we, we don't say what we show up with, but there's a little something that's there, right? A little something that's there. And it's different because guess what? They want to be engaged as well. You know, they want, they want, you know, in today's day and age as a professional speaker, we hear meeting planners saying content, content, content. Ask the audience. Get serious. Ask the audience. They're saying engagement. Uh, I want to connect with that speaker. Tell me something that I can't see. You know, I, I love it when, you know, if people are watching us right now and, and we're kind enough to have somebody go, hey, let's see who this Spangler guy is. And you Google Spangler, you're going to fall into this abyss. You're going to go down this rabbit hole of all these videos. And then you're going to go down the rabbit hole of all these products. And as long as people can't devour me and the time that we have together, then I got enough to share. You know, uh, I, I love, love it. it. So I want to follow up with you on something you said about about how the the content appears engage uh, excuse me appears organic, and I think that was really interesting because I think one of the things that makes you so approachable is you just look like a guy that's having fun doing science experiments. I mean, yeah. I don't want to say you look like a kid because I, I don't mean to be derogatory in any way, but like you just look like you're having fun. And I think people can relate to that. So how does that then translate to a business that maybe isn't as fun as something that you're doing? Well, I don't know that anybody, you know, at a certain point, uh, a business is a business. And so um, I think that organically people start to see what is this business all about and how do people interact with this business. And they see this guy who's the spokesperson. I happen to be the guy, right? So you're the spokesperson and people are looking at this uh, saying, well, wait, uh, I, I want to do that. And it doesn't seem to be unapproachable. Um, so maybe a better way of saying it is... Um, I learned from experience that once I started presenting things that were over the top, you know, the Ellen show has been so kind over the last 11 years. I've been, uh, the last episode was the, my 22nd appearance on the Ellen show. And how wonderful to wow. have a wonderful lady say, do whatever you want, biggest mess you want to go nuts. And it's been hard to tell her producers sometimes that the tabletop things that we do, the thing with the soda can and a little bowl of water, the thing with the food coloring or whatever, that's what goes viral. When you look at those videos, yes, the explosion goes viral, but the silly thing gets 4 million views on Facebook or whatever, and it's just oil and water and food coloring and an Alka-Seltzer tablet. I mean, how crazy is that? I, I oh, remember the thing my kids loved the most was the snow. 
like oh, just, just creating the snow out of nothing. And I mean, I mean, amazed him. They could do it all day long. Yeah. Well, and to correct you, because there's going to be some people going, nah, did he really come up with Mentos and Diet Coke? Uh, we had all played with dropping things into soda and trying to get the soda to come out. But that was in the late 80s, early 90s. It was always wintergreen lifesavers. They changed the size of wintergreen lifesavers. So we're all searching for a different candy. A teacher says, a guy by the name of Lee Merrick says, you know, these things called Mentos kind of work. He'd done it on television a couple of times. I did it on television television a couple of times, but I happened to be at the perfect place at the perfect time because nobody cared about those things previously. Uh, YouTube was three months old and I happened to take what was on regular television, scrape it and put it on this little website called YouTube back in September of 2005. And that thing exploded. And why did it explode? Because we just come through an entire generation of telling kids, don't try this at home. Everything was don't try this at home. And here's this man child blowing up bottles of soda with Mentos and a kid going, not only am I trying it, I'm going to post to this weird website called, what is it called? YouTube. And it took off. So I was in the perfect place at the perfect time. But I think that the piece that I did have some control over is that I presented it differently than anything we had seen in academia before. It was, um, there was no real catch. Uh, you can do things, but when you connect and you get that perfect uh, I call it uh, when you get perfect connection, experience and engagement, and those three come together like a Venn diagram, the very center is what I call best day ever. And a best day ever is when a kid comes up to you and puts his arms around you, her arms around you and goes, today was the best day ever. And you go, buddy, it was just a bottle of soda and Mentos. And they go, yeah. oh, no, but that's the thing they're going to talk about forever. And so that comes together. And in business, what is the best day they ever look like for our customers? And we talked about it briefly on our podcast that really has kind of grown to be very organic. When somebody says best day ever, it's not contrived. That's a real genuine response from a kid. And my question to corporations as I get to talk to them is, how are we doing that for our customers? What are we putting in place so they get to, they may not even verbalize it that way, but how do we create that best day ever for them? So they'll go out and promote the product, tell other people about it, help us create even more. That's the only way I created 350 science products that are in our line um, right now. And that's one of the companies that we was recently acquired was Steve Spangler Science. Uh, but the people who acquired it said, we're acquiring the brand. We want that name. We love your products. But you've worked 25 years to create Steve Spangler Science and hop on a plane tomorrow to New York for the New York Toy Fair uh, to launch the new line of Steve Spangler Science products. So it's alive and well. It's just being run by somebody else, which is kind of a strange thing. Yeah, although although kind of awesome at the at the end of the day, um, I love the uh, concept of the best day ever. I think that's a great way to to look at you know that in business it's not just about delivering the product or service that people are paying us to deliver because today's consumer wants that engagement. They want the relationship with the company. I think that's why, you know, I've been saying for a while now that I think social media plays such a big role in why we're even talking about customer experience because social media gave customers a public voice for the first time. And with that voice, they said, hey, I want a better experience than I'm getting right now. Yeah. And and uh, the companies that listen to them are the ones that are doing uh, really a uh, uh, you know, doing really well today because yeah. they're listening, they're engaging, and they are giving back to what, you know, what the customer wants yeah. in terms of a relationship today. Well, um, let, me add, let me add to that because I think that there's the, the, the reason that this has become a science is because there's no formula. I mean, there's formulaic science, but the, but the thing that we're still discovering and still exploring is every customer resonates at a different frequency. Every brand puts out this, uh, their stuff. Let's just call it for sake of, uh, of argument and energy, so to speak. And uh, energy in the form of a uh, vibration, right? Will cause certain things to resonate. Sometimes you get a glass that will resonate at the perfect frequency, it'll crack, right? Now, millions of other frequencies, it does nothing, but at that one specific, so I think customers are like that. If you take sand and you put it out on a plate and you vibrate that plate with a speaker, the sand starts to create patterns and you change the frequency ever so slightly and the pattern just vanishes and you change it a little bit more and the pattern is created another new pattern. And that's exactly what we're doing in business is there is no cut and dry solution for how we resonate with our people and how we engage. Some people want a lot more 
more engagement and some people want to build a different kind of connection. Some people don't even care about the experience as much as we would. It's that fine tuning of those elements that are there that once you find that subset, you do it, you get some momentum and then you have to be okay as a business to go, let's move on and change the frequency of them and see if we can attract somebody else. That's, I see what you, I see yeah, what you yeah. did there. You said you get some mementos. I heard that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so, hey, um, Matthew has a question uh, based on your story a little bit earlier uh, about uh, being in the right place at the right time with YouTube. He said, did you purposely present the Mentos Coke thing differently to make it catch fire or was it just you doing you and it went viral? Um, uh, I wish I could tell you, the mag great question. I wish I could tell you there was something magic behind it. I got in trouble. Um, I, it was... Uh, I'd done it on television. I have a standing gig with the NBC affiliate in Denver called uh, KUSA 9 News. And it just keeps me in practice. For the last 20 years, the red light comes on on Monday and I do live TV. And so I, uh, this was in 2005. And, and I told the co-host that I was with, I said, you know, earlier in the day, hey, we're going to do the thing with the soda where I take the carbon dioxide out of the soda. She goes, oh, yeah. I said, now we'll be in the backyard. Just stand back. My producer, before we started, said, hey, listen, if you're going to use Coke, you got to use Pepsi. I don't want it there to be a problem with the advertisers. <laughs> and the only thing I contributed was we're going to use Diet Coke and Diet Pepsi because it's not sticky. So uh -huh. it's easy to clean up the mess. See, been in television for too many years. There you go. So the only thing that was uh, the thing that I can never go back and change is that Kim, the person I was with, was in front of the Diet Coke. I was in front of the Diet Pepsi. Kim puts it over the top, let's go, dressed in this beautiful St. John's outfit. What? She keeps her hand there a little too long, poof, comes up, hits shh, on her, right? And it uncovered. And I did mine, everything was fine. She goes, oh my gosh. And she's wet three more times on live TV in that segment. She does the same thing. It's like, Kim, you got to stand back. By the end of the segment, she's drenched. Audience, I think it's got to love this, right? Yeah. And all they did for the rest of the night was to replay that spot because Kim had to do the five o'clock, six o'clock, uh, <laughs> nine o'clock, and ten o'clock, right? And he's still goofy and they loved it. The only thing I did to tweak it at all to get to Matthew's question is that there is this little technique called blogging, right? And think about it 2005, I simply posted on the blog, science experiment goes awry, uh, news anchor gets soaked, or something like that. And the, Great headline. Uh, the Associated Press picked it up, shut down the Gannett server. That's when I got called in to the VP's office at Gannett saying, never post anything like this on our website again. How I mean, Think about that. Think about that. <laughs> Too many oh, people dude, visiting our website. <laughs> and I shut down a silly little server. Well, I mean, six people were on it. And so that's when I scraped it and I probably shouldn't have and put it and found that little thing called YouTube. So it was purposeful from the standpoint of I knew people wanted it. How do I position in such a way that you make the other person the hero? It wasn't, hey, look at what I did and it's hands off. It's like, hey, everybody, you try this. And I didn't realize that I was reaching out to an audience and inviting them to be the hero. And in my line of business, you know, as a speaker, you want to think that, hey, I'm the hero, can't do my demos. And I've always succeeded when you create something to say, now you do it, you be the hero. You want to be a hero in front of your kids. If I taught you 10 things to do in front of your kids that made you a rock star, you'd come back to me and go, hey, give me 10 more. That's the secret. Exactly. I'm totally with you. In fact, that's why I named my company the experience maker, not because I believe I'm the experience maker, but because I want to teach other people to be that in their companies. Yep. So I absolutely- see it through you. That's the thing is they yep. see it through you and through the people you bring. So you really, you're the guy that um, you just are humble enough to not say it. Me, I named the company Steve Spangler Science because I'm not creative. So <laughs> that's how it works. All right. I got one more question for you and then we're going to have to run. But uh, I have a, a question from Mark, um, who I think I know why he uh, he wants to ask this question. But he says, what, what do you think the difference would have been if you had access to live video like we have right now and you did a live stream of the initial experiment? Um, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. I don't know. Um, we've done... Well, we've done a live stream like when, when Facebook started its live streaming, we tried to do some experiments that, yeah, I mean, it wasn't Mentos Diet Coke. It was still really cool things that, that people now are doing, whether it's the smoke rings from the trash can or elephant's toothpaste or whatever. And um, I don't know, good reaction. But 
I, I think we were at the right place at the right time. It was just so weird that so many people shared that original uh, video and then came back to it. I mean, we saw the formula and the formula um, I thought was me presenting a science experiment and everybody would love it. And we found that the engagement was really low. A lot of people watched, but they didn't really engage. We didn't see real success on YouTube until we created a series called Sick Science, S-I-C-K. So youtube.com slash sick S-I-C-K, science, because kids today go, that's sick, which means it's cool. These were minute and a half videos where you can't see me. You just see hands. You just see uh, an exp uh, experience happening there, an experiment. Totally, you could do at home. No focus on the person. Everything focused on that. And it's only a minute and a half. And right now, we're approaching almost 200 million views on that. Oh, video. Amazing. Um, because amazing. it was focused on something else. It wasn't focused on the person. So... I don't know. It's a great question. I think it was, I think we were lucky at the right place at the right time. I'll also add one more thing that, uh, that you may be just being bashful about is I think you do an amazing job of explaining to people the why behind what's going on. So it's not just, Hey, this is a cool explosion, but it's an act, but, but you walk away understanding why it happened. And that's the whole concept of making learning an experience and making it fun so that, you know, the kids then go and tell their friends, Hey, look what I learned about what happens with carbon dioxide. If I do this and this and this. And I think that's what was real, what, what makes it so memorable. Obviously everybody loves a good explosion, but uh, I think understanding behind it was really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, I, we could do this for so much longer. I, I, I love talking to you and, and it makes me feel like a kid again. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, best of luck in, uh, in whatever comes next. And hopefully you'll hit uh, 30 or 40 times on Ellen's show. I'm sure she'll keep asking you back. Fantastic. Thank you. And next week, uh, we will have Ryan Baker, who is a, another buddy of mine. He's a social manager, social media manager at Nutrisystem, a very interesting company. So we will talk about uh, how he has become the experience maker at his organization. Again, thank you to Steve Spangler for joining us this week on the Experience Maker. We're here every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern, half an hour in and out live on LinkedIn. And then we do republish uh, it on YouTube as well. And thank you so much much for joining us. We'll see you next week. My name is Dan Gingas. Have a great rest of the day.